Hello folks and welcome back and this time we will be diving into music and specifically the music perspective here in English 306 with me Dr. Matt Barton and you know this is a, a perspective that I don't know I don't really feel like I have to, to market all that hard uh, lots of students really enjoy this perspective because everybody likes music right it's, it's and I think everybody has at least one song uh, that they've heard at some point that changed their life or at least made them think about things a little bit differently and sort of uh, helped them grow, uh, if you will. I know I've had that experience with not just one, but uh, many different songs as well as, as bands. So I think it's something that everybody can relate to uh, to some degree. And you've probably already done some, even if you didn't know what you were doing, uh, some form of rhetorical analysis on those songs. So it, it's really good. And likewise, I could say, too, you, you've probably had that experience of uh, having a, a song you've listened to many times and enjoyed, but then one day you decide, you know, I'm going to really just sit down and listen to the lyrics of this song and see what they're saying. And then realize, oh, <laughs> that, that song does not, uh, you know, I do not agree with the, the lyrics of that song. Or maybe the, you know, maybe it was a song you didn't, realize uh spoke to you could be the opposite but but anyway my point is i think we can all uh, uh you know experience something like that and thus uh, gravitate towards this perspective but anyway here's the objectives for today we'll look at how uh, music functions as communication for individuals and groups just sort of how it communicates uh, then we'll get into the rhetorical side of this and the you know, uh, Cell now points out there's many different rhetorical theories you could use to talk about music, and we've already done that to some extent. Remember, we talked about the Grateful Dead, and I believe that was the uh, was that symbolic convergence theory and fantasy themes where they were talking about that. Very possible to mix and match, take a little bit of this music perspective, blend it with the symbolic convergence theory or Burke or whatever the case may be. Uh, but we'll be looking at one um, that you can use just by itself, called the Illusion of Life Perspective. And what's neat about it is that it combines the music with the lyrics. So you don't talk about them separately, you look at them together, it's pretty cool. Uh, specifically, how they not just how it doesn't just communicate, but it also persuades. Uh, let's see, then we'll list the steps for doing this analysis, and then we'll look at some student essays, you know, in the back of the book, take a, a gander at what others have done. It's always useful to have a model in place. Uh, so she uh, starts off here, we talk about these symbols again. Remember she talked before at the beginning of the book about indexes and icons and symbols. And remember the uh, uh, the the symbol part of that work was the ones that were uh, not really tied to reality but just sort of conventional, meaning that everybody just kind of agrees this is what this means, right? It's not. It doesn't look like the thing necessarily. <laughs> like the letter or like these letters, D-O-G, dog, uh, we know that's a word, dog, but it doesn't look literally, you know, if you look at those symbols, these letters, they don't look like a, <laughs> you know, the actual canine. <laughs> at least I hope they don't to you. Uh, if they do, you might want to have that looked at. Uh, anyway, we've got um, discursive and non-discursive symbols. Now, the discursive ones, this word comes back to the word discourse, and discourse just means written or spoken communication, right? So it's just kind of a related term. It's like the adjective form of discourse, I guess. Uh, so you don't say discursive, you say discursive. And that just means uh, a word. It could be a spoken word. It could be uh, a written word. Okay, that's just <laughs> simple as that. <laughs> uh, but there's other ways to communicate, as we all know. It's not just the, the words. <clears throat> and that's what this other type of symbol is about, the non-discursive symbol and it's a little bit weird to think about these as symbols but that's what we're going to go with and there's two basic camps or categories uh, one being body language you know you're moving your arms your hands around you're <laughs> shaking your fist uh, the way you're standing you know you're leaning in you back uh, all that kind of good stuff uh, that's called body language uh, but there's also uh, something called para language and when you see this a lot of uh Academics like to stick this prefix para onto things, P-A-R-A, -A, and that just means like something. 
So it's not, so paralanguage means it's something like language, but it's not language per se. So it's kind of, it's a little bit functioning similar to words. Uh, and the paralanguage is a nonverbal vocal cue. So it's something you do with your mouth <laughs> instead of body language. So you wouldn't put a hand gesture and say that's paralanguage according to this definition. It would just be something like the pitch of your voice. So if you go way high, or if you get really low, <laughs> or if you're shouting or whispering or you're talking quickly you know, or, or slowly, you know, you can sort of color or shade the meaning of a word that way, right? You could read the same line in an angry tone, or you could read that line in a very soft-spoken way, and that will uh, affect the meaning. That's paralanguage. Okay, so rhetoric versus communication then. Uh, so you remember when she talked about uh, uh, the symbols and the icons and all that stuff uh, at the beginning of the book, she mentioned signs. And uh, <clears throat> let me just skip ahead to this. Uh, so the sign, according to Cell Now, was something that has a sort of a personal or unique meaning. And I, if I recall correctly, she used the example of a wedding ring or wedding band. And she says that, you know, she wears her wedding band, wedding ring, and when she looks at it, it has a meaning for her, right? Her, her, her significant other, her spouse, probably thinks about her wedding, you know, all of that sort of, uh, you know, stuff associated with that. But if I looked at the ring or you looked at the ring, we wouldn't have any of those connections because we weren't there. <laughs> don't even know who, uh, you probably don't even know who Sal now is, you know, much less, uh, you know, all the stuff about her wedding. Uh, on the other hand, the wedding band does have this other meaning that's shared amongst the culture. So if you looked at the, you say, oh, she's got a ring. You know, that's a wedding ring. It means uh, marriage, right? And all that that implies. That's the artifact uh, part of it. So the artifact is that sort of bigger meaning that everybody associates with it. And that's different than just the sign that has like a personal thing for her. And so she's going to be saying the same thing here about music. And she brings this up here because a lot of people when you start talking about this music perspective of uh, rhetoric, they think about a song that has a lot of personal meaning to them, and uh, that's not really going to work. That's not really <clears throat> the type of analysis we want. Uh, we want to be thinking about that bigger picture again, the cultural meanings, not just, uh, you know, this song meant a lot to me and my buddies, or this is like our song. You know, when, when uh, coming back to this wedding thing again, you might have a song that's like your song, your you, know, you and your significant other love this song. It kind of has this special meaning to you. Uh, that, that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, we will just be talking about, well, what would anybody think that was listening to that song or, or the particular target audience? Uh, and then we distinguish it from a few other things here too. The musical aesthetics is typically what you think about when you think about a music class. You know, most classes you might take about music <coughs> You know, it's either a class about how to play the music and you know, how to perform on an instrument. Again, not something we're dealing with here. Or there's this other kind of class where it's, you know, uh, here's Bach, you know, and listen to the, oh, I don't even know the terminology. What is it? The counterpoint, uh, you know, listen to these, uh, all these instruments coming together and, you know, the upbeats and the crescendos and, you know, all that sort of terminology. Uh, the idea being that, you know, most people that just sit down and listen to a piece of classical music won't get it. That way they just, <laughs> you have to be taught <laughs> how to appreciate this kind of music. Like going to a museum, an art gallery, and looking at the paintings there. It, it sort of helps if you know a little bit about the, uh, you know, the, the art aesthetics. If you take a class like that, they'll teach you basically, why is this so special, this painting of the Mona Lisa? You know, what, what makes it so great? <laughs> it's not obvious, just looking at it, <laughs> at least for me. Um, so that's again not this is basically what we're not covering and then music as communication so the idea that here is the music does communicate nobody's saying it doesn't uh, I, forgot, I was just thinking about, about bird calls a while ago and if you go out into the woods and listen you'll hear birds sound like they're playing music or whistling or you know making <laughs> you know they're tweeting they're doing all that stuff now it's clear that they're communicating you know, it could be communicating uh, something like, you know, here I am, come, uh, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> you know, who knows what these birds are saying. Um, but, you know, we're not really talking about music just in terms of, like, how it works to communicate something. 
you know, we'll again leave that to science, uh, to scientists to figure this out, to psychologists maybe. <laughs> um, but we're thinking more about how, uh, how it can persuade people. So not just that it communicates messages. You know, everybody sort of gets that. Uh, but how can this actually affect change in society? Uh, how could a song make a difference, you know, be a change agent, if you will? So here's a, a quick example that came to my mind as I was reading this chapter. Uh, one of my favorite bands, CCR, Creedence Clearwater Revival. I think pretty much everybody likes this band <laughs> to some level. <laughs> kind of like, uh, I guess, the Eagles or you know, the, the, uh, the Beatles. You know, these bands that everybody seems to like, at least on some level. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was reading about their song, Fortunate Son. And it's one I hadn't ever sat down until today and really looked at the lyrics and read a, a little bit about the, the, the context of the song. And, you know, as it turns out, it was deliberately meant as an anti-war, anti-Vietnam uh, war anthem. And so it's kind of deliberately chosen for that end. So just take a listen to it. Put the closed captioning on. There's a little CC button there on YouTube so you can see the, the words. And then uh, think about the words and the music. That's just how to, don't, don't get too technical with it at this point. Uh, I just want you to think about what is it trying to persuade you to think or believe about something. Uh, you know, what, what can you uh, ferret out by watching that? Okay, to move on then, we have the illusion of life perspective. And again, many different possibilities here, but this is the one they talk about in this book. And it's based on a couple of books by Suzanne Langer. And there's a picture of Langer there. So like Burke and Borman of uh, the SCT, SCT FDA analysis, it's all about symbols. So you got animals and humans, and humans are animals, but what makes humans different than, say, those birds we were talking about a while ago is that we get symbolism. Uh, symbolism is really important in these philosophies because it's not just something cool, it actually is in, you know, how we think. This is what makes us humans gives us the ability to know things and to understand things. <clears throat> so it's, you know, obviously key. Now that's, you know, again, just kind of what Burke and Borman are saying. Uh, what Langer, though, adds to the mix is how she talks about works of art. So it's not just for her, it's not just music. You know, she also talks about art uh, doing the same thing. But she talks about how when you paint something or you play some music, you write a song, you're sort of capturing your emotional state, you know, how you feel about something, how you feel at that moment in reality. Like right now, I feel this sort of emotion. I'm going to sit down and play my guitar <laughs> and try to uh, channel that emotion into the guitar. Uh, so it's kind of expressing that feeling uh, of that artist. And then that becomes a representation. And when somebody else sits down and listens to my guitar playing, if I'm a good artist, I suppose, or if it's authentic, uh, then you'll be able to hear that and maybe... Uh, uh, you know, experience something similar, right? It's kind of like uh, uh, being by a virtual, <clears throat> a virtual experience of that emotion I was feeling for real. Uh, okay, so music mimics the rhythms we experience every day as humans. You know, at least this is the theory, and I, I'm not going to get real technical with this because it's <laughs> kind of beyond me, some of it. Um, but this part is pretty obvious. You know, when you're really excited, worked up, you know, your heart's beating quick, your breathing is shallow, might be panting, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, versus when you're relaxed and, you, of course, you're breathing differently, your heart is slower. So I think that's kind of the basic idea here is if things are tense or you're trying to build up excitement, your heartbeat goes faster and you can think about drums, you know, if like a marching band, right? If it's you're about to <laughs> go out there, like boom, 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 you know, things get loud, things get fast. Uh, things get exciting, uh, and that's kind of like your heartbeat getting faster and faster. And then, of course, the opposite of that, some really slow, somber song uh, would do the opposite. So feelings of tension and relief. Release intensity, it's really just that simple. Uh, so sort of to bring this home, I want to play some of my favorite music for you. Uh, you know, <clears throat> you probably know I like video games, and this is one of the best. Uh, so listen to a couple of tracks from this, Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, and I specifically chose these because they don't have lyrics. I don't want you to think about lyrics right now. I just, I just want you to listen to the 
uh, the feel or listen to these tracks here and think about just how, how does it make you feel? Is your heart beat going up? Is it going down? Do you feel tense? Do you feel relaxed? Uh, just, just compare these two songs and then uh, try to describe how they make you feel. All right, how music works rhetorically. So music is rhetorical when it represents actual life experiences and emotions as an illusion of life based on the artist's perspective, thereby conveying an argument about how we ought to or ought not to believe or behave. So, so excuse me, Sonal's been saying basically the same thing about all these different perspectives, right? That ultimately what matters is does it have something to argue about how we ought to or ought not to believe or behave and I want to draw your attention to a couple pieces of this definition so this this idea about representing actual life experiences and emotions that's kind of the key of this Langer philosophy right is the artist isn't just living vicariously or imagining things they're really having these emotions they're really talking about you know experiences uh, and they sort of make a model, and that model is the song or the painting or whatever the case, you know, whatever this artist is working with, whatever medium. Um, and it represents those things for you. And it goes a little bit beyond that, so that would just be art. Okay, so it becomes rhetorical, though, if there's something there about how we ought to believe or behave towards something. You know, you feel one way before you look at the painting or before you look listen to the song, you listen to the song, and I guess if it works, then you'll have a different point of view. Uh, that's what—that's the kind of song we're talking about here. Uh, and they have two ways of going about this, again, according to this perspective. The virtual experience, and again, this is like a model of that artist's experience, a representation of that experience. Just the word virtual just means it's not the actual thing. It's a model of the thing in the form of a song, right? Uh, so you got this experience you know, what are you talking about? What happened to you? Uh, what are you uh, planning? You know, th those will be in the lyrics, the words of the song. And then the, this idea of the time. So again, the is it fast? Is it slow? Heart beating quick, heart beating slow, relaxed, tense. And that will be the virtual time. And that's what's encapsulated in the music part of it. At least in terms of, we're talking about music now. So, you know, music has a time, a time signature, and, and all that stuff, some songs are fast, some songs are slow, and that's kind of like uh, uh, an experience of time. You know, if you're, if you're, he might say, time flies when you're having fun. And <laughs> you know, that, that's the kind of idea here. The, like a fun song would probably be faster uh, than a slow one. Uh, okay, virtual experience, the lyrics. Uh, so song lyrics, according to uh, Langer, are either comic or tragic, and this sounds, probably sounds familiar to you. Uh, from when we were talking about the, uh, yeah, yeah, what was that, a symbolic convergence theory, I believe, or the narrative? Anyway, <laughs> I remember talking about this. <laughs> uh, so the comic lyrics, again, this doesn't necessarily mean comedy, you know, it's not necessarily funny. It's just uh, uplifting somehow, you know, they're out there, they're determined to beat the odds. You know, go, go get them, you know, and <laughs> we will win. <laughs> um I will survive. I mean, she talks about that song as actually having both comic and tragic. Uh, but anyway, if you listen to something like Jock Jams, I mean, that's, that's what this is all about, right? <laughs> you know, you listen to this to get pumped up. You want to go work out. Uh, you know, like, I don't feel like working out. You know, okay, well, let's listen to some Jock Jams. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I'm pumped. You know, now I'm ready. You know, I'm feeling better. You know, that, that's the comic lyrics. Um, and then we have these uh, tragic lyrics down here, which these are the, I guess you call them more serious, a more somber take, something doesn't necessarily mean sad, but you know, there's just something there they're having to cope with. This is almost, almost like a therapy kind of music. And I was thinking about the song, uh, a song that I think many of us tear up. <laughs> you know, I can barely even think of the name of the song without getting a little bit teary eyed. Uh, but there's a song called Feed Jake by Pirates of the Mississippi country song a lot of country songs i would say are kind of like tragic you know i lost my <laughs> lost my wife lost my car <laughs> it's just kind of the stereotypical country song uh, they tend to be a little slower still guitar you know and, and that, that kind of thing uh, so you can think about those fitting more into this tragic 
and release pattern. Okay, and then we have types of illusion in the lyrics. And this is basically uh, just whether this is talking about something in the future or the song is addressing something upcoming that's, that's going to happen or is it looking back you know at some previous point of that artist uh, artist's life some past experience uh, so we have a song like uh, in my life by the beatles really really good song one of my favorites so you can listen to that and it's kind of like looking back you know on the stuff that's happened um to the, uh, I don't remember if it's London or McCartney that wrote that. Uh, but anyway, it's kind of like a reflection of their past, you know, their experiences, right? So you see, that's the poetic illusion. Uh, and then the dramatic illusion is the opposite of that. So instead of looking back, we're looking forward. You know, so, something's happening in the future. And again, just to come back to the Beatles, the song Hey Jude, you know, he's talking there to uh, his son, if I recall correctly. You know, like saying these things are going to happen or these are some situations you'll be in and here's some things you can do <laughs> here's my advice for when you're in this situation uh, jude so those will offer a sense of suspense because you never know what's going to happen there's always a little bit of a surprise there or anxiety i suppose seeking resolution that tends to reinforce an intensity pattern so it kind of makes sense that it would fit with the intensity you know if you're thinking about that jock jam you know let's let's go win the game <laughs> you know you're kind of tense because you never really quite know whether you're going to win you could lose right uh so you need that intensity um you know it's not you want you don't want to get too relaxed <laughs> uh, okay congruity and incongruity this is a pretty interesting I, I like this part of it um so this basically just means do the lyrics match the music so you got a, a sort of emotional tone, a feeling expressed in the in the words, but does that match the musical style? Okay, and so we've got a song that was popular when I was in high school. It just seemed like it was on repeat play, and I played it incessantly at my prom prom party and all this. It was called uh, "The Crossroads" uh, by Bone Thugs in Harmony. <laughs> Uh, and they uh, use that example in the book, which I thought was kind of cool, is, as it's kind of a sad, well, it's not kind of a sad, it's a very sad song. And the music, musically, it's also quite sad. You know, we'd say it's a very release pattern driven song. You know, I don't think you, uh, it's kind of like the slow, a slow dancing song. You know, this is not something you rock out to. <laughs> uh, but it's congruent because those things match. But, uh, it's not necessarily the case that the tone of a lyric and the tone of a song are going to go together. You know, sometimes they're the opposite. They clash. It can be really strange sometimes. And there's a couple of examples. There's a song called Pumped Up Kicks by Foster the People. And, you know, by the way, if you haven't heard these, uh, I, I hadn't heard that one either. I just looked it up on YouTube. Uh, all the stuff's on YouTube, of course, or, you know, whatever your sound, uh, whatever you use for songs. But take a listen to that song. And it sounds really happy to me, real cheerful. You know, you think, oh, this is fun, you know, fun little song. Uh, but when you look up uh, the lyrics and start thinking about it, <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> that does not seem to match those happy lyrics. Uh, and, you know, the same thing by the song Green Day. They mentioned in the book, uh, Good Riddance. And so basically congruent and incongruent. Uh, pretty simple to, to uh, grasp, but it's pretty cool when you think about it that uh, songs can do this. I mean, this is. I mean, songs are wonderful things, aren't they? <laughs> and this one is a pretty weird concept: ambiguity, and they call it strategic ambiguity. And this was a from an article. I looked up and read the article they were based talking about here. Uh, it was a lot about Bob Dylan, and Bob Dylan went through a phase of. Uh, you know, he's from Minnesota, by the way. Uh, but it was uh, he went through this sort of I think they called it a born again Christian phase. So he was always going through these different phases. You know he went off started off with this real folky folk music. Then he did the rock and roll, and then I guess sometime in the eighties he went to Christian like super Christian born again music. And I don't know what happened after that. Uh, but they wrote about that period of his life, and they were this is where they come up with these terms. So I'll try to use some of those examples because I think they're pretty good. Uh, but anyways, if you're being ambiguous about something, that means you're not really giving the specifics, right? Not, not necessarily lying, but you're just kind of putting it out there. It's kind of vague. You know, it could mean this, could mean that. Uh, it's ambiguous, right? 
Uh, and strategic just means you're doing that deliberately. So it's not accidentally being vague. You know, you're deliberately doing this and for some rhetorical reason. So you got some purpose for being vague on the topic. You know, one thing that I always think about when I hear about this term in music, I think about all the songs that have been written about real people, like songs about ex-girlfriends or boyfriends or whatever the case may be, but they don't actually put the, that person's name in the song anywhere. Uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of up to the audience. You know, they, they can try to guess, uh, you know, who is that song written about? You know, and maybe the artist will say, oh, well, it was written about so-and-so. Uh, or maybe they won't ever say. You know, they're kind of being deliberately vague about that topic. And so I think that kind of applies here too, but, you know, that really wouldn't be all that rhetorical because really, who, who cares? <laughs> uh, but if it does have some kind of political significance or some kind of historical commentary, you know, if it's trying to change our attitudes or beliefs about some something that matters, right, in the bigger picture, uh, then you'd say it was uh, rhetorical strategic ambiguity. And some of these examples are kind of weird. I always think it's weird when you hear about these uh, political rallies and they'll play, uh, they have like a playlist and they'll be playing songs from pop music at these rallies. Sometimes they'll have the actual band uh, there. But sometimes what you have is uh, they play the song and then you'll hear the band, like the Rolling Stones, um, uh, they'll come out and say we don't we don't want them to play that song. <laughs> you know we, we're opposed to that. You know that politician, or we don't like those policies, or you know, you know we they, they'll even sue. You know they'll go to court and try to sue to not let them play the songs. I don't know how. I don't think that ever works out. I think you're <laughs> somehow they still somehow manage to play these songs even though they're being being sued. Uh, that's an example. that's kind of interesting to me though because it kind of shows how if a song is ambiguous. You can play it maybe for a totally different purpose, and it seems to resonate, even if that's not at all what the creator of the song had in mind. And so maybe that was like not, you know, Mick Jagger, I think, might have written the song. We're talking about uh, you know, that song. Sometimes you do, you don't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. I don't, that's, I don't know if that's the title of the song or not. But, you know, he was having some kind of feeling... Uh, an emotion, so he created that song, and that song kind of crystallized that, and people can listen to it. But you know, here's an example where it's being played in a context that he personally disagrees with. But you know, d does it matter? Uh, I guess you know, since it's so ambiguous, you know, it's not specific enough uh, to a scenario. Okay, and then ascription is another part of this that goes along with the. Uh, let me scooch myself over here. <laughs> here we go. Okay, so uh, again, Bob Dylan going through these Jesus years, and Gonzalez and McKay are the ones writing about this part of the uh, the book. And so they come up with this term ascription, which if you're ascribing something, that means you're just referring to somebody. You're referencing something else. I don't know why they didn't just call it referencing, but there you go. And there's two types of it. Uh, there is lyrical ascription, so the songs will reference, uh, there'll be words in there that will have some connection to uh, some other thing, some part of pop culture that will appeal to their audience. So the book, I think, talks about, oh God, what was the name? The, the Newsboys, some band like that, and how they put in words like Captain Crunch, <laughs> you know, like Pop-Tarts, I don't know, breakfast cereals, uh, just things that would appeal to their audience. <clears throat> <clears throat> things that would click, I guess, with their, their audience. The audience would find fun. You know, of course, uh, rap and hip-hop are, are great at this, too. They're always, you know, making references to all kinds of stuff all throughout the, the songs. I, I, you know, by the way, I think, uh, you know, if you look at you're not sure what to write about. Rap and hip-hop are almost always good choices, you know, because there's a lot of lyrics to work with, and they tend to make a lot of uh, references to things. So it's quite a bit of fun uh, to analyze those. Uh, but anyway, Bob Dylan is doing it. At this uh, Born Again concert by uh, his songs, he will put in songs, in, in, in his song lyrics, there will be <coughs> little clips of Bible verses, you know, uh, famous passages from the Bible will be sort of woven in, and that will appeal to the people that are there at this concert, uh, the Christians, you know, the evangel evangelicals. <laughs> so they'll like that, so that's sort of stuff he puts in there for them. Uh, but then he, <clears throat> he will also put in uh, ascriptions or references to his other songs that he wrote before this. And he's got a lot of big hits. Uh, 
you know, all those great folk and the rock songs I was talking about. So we might uh, put in a little line or two from those songs, and that will appeal to the people that are here at this concert because they just like Bob Dylan. You know, maybe there's people that went to this that aren't Christian, that don't care about Christian stuff, but they just want to hear Bob Dylan and they like his uh, his repertoire that he wrote before this. <laughs> so it's kind of like there's some stuff in there for them uh, that Dylan, you know, pops in. So all of that, though, is lyrical description. And then the musical description is the sound. sound of the, It's the music part of it, right? The, the instrumentation. And those will also have appeals to certain target audiences who might otherwise ignore the song. Uh, so again, coming back to this Dylan example, if you listen to these songs, there will be like gospel choir sounding parts of the song. You know, just like if you went to church on Sunday, uh, you'd hear that kind of music. And so that's in there. But he also sort of puts in uh, the more rock uh, folk sounds, you know, from this previous uh, repertoire. Uh, so it kind of merges the two. So again, there's a little something in there for the two different audiences. You know, and the book talks about a couple of bands, uh, the kind of uh, the, the Christian bands, you know, they sort of have this persuasive purpose, I guess, is to get you to go to church or to, uh, you know, uh, to read the Bible, let's say something along, to get born again, you know, basically. Uh, so that will be the what they're trying to persuade you to do, or right? change your be beliefs and behaviors about something. But they know that if it was just like, here's a, here's a recording of a choir, you know, singing uh, Amazing Grace or something, very traditional, uh, you might say, I don't care about that. You know, that, that's not my thing, you know. But if they kind of uh, say, well, okay, we'll ditch that and let, let's just have like a heavy metal, you know, do all this and we'll, we'll put in some, uh, uh, some lyrics that sound kind of uh, uh, like a metal. I, 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 this is an example I have to share with you on this. <laughs> you know, I remember, I think it was LSU campus. I was there for whatever reason. And there was a kind of an amphitheater. And I was, we were, I was with some friends and, you know, we noticed that this amphitheater, kind of outdoor seating, you know, was, was kind of filling up with people. There was like, you know, a few people out there and it seemed to be some more coming in. So we thought, what's going on? Something must be happening here. And so we went over there and asked, what's going on? And they're like, oh, there's going to be a concert here, you know, a heavy metal concert. And we're like, oh, wow, cool, heavy metal. <laughs> And uh, I remember it was a little bit weird because the guy was there, the guy that told us about this was handing out Bibles, like little, these little pocket Bibles. And we thought, well, maybe he's like protesting the metal. And like he's somebody there that's kind of like, don't listen to the heavy metal, you know, be, be a Christian. <laughs> so, so we kind of stuck around, had no clue uh, what was really happening. You know, and these, these bands started to come out and it was uh, a death metal band it's just just like straight up nobody ever understands the lyrics of those anyway you know, oh, chunk, chunk, chunk. Uh, we were loving it uh, but every now and then you'd like be able to tell like some some of the lyrics would be clear enough for you to make out and, you know my friend uh, sitting next to me was like you know man i don't know about this <laughs> <laughs> this concert, <laughs> I, I think there's something going on here. There's something, there's something a little bit, uh, you, you know, fishy about this the whole setup, you know. And it wasn't just that we were like the only ones in the audience. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, but I remember uh, it makes it stand up because I remember when the band was finished, it was kind of like a little interview with the band, and they said, uh, "Well, what we do, uh, we take um, verses out of the Bible." That sound kind of uh, death metal -y. you know. <laughs> There's quite a few. <laughs> I mean, if you just listen to the lyrics, you might think, wow, this is just like, uh, you know, any other death metal band with these really harsh, violent, sort of dark lyrics. Uh, but he was, they, they were literally, it wasn't stuff they made up, you know, it's just literally quotes out of the Bible that they sort of put into these songs to make it sound, uh, again, the sort of this lyrical description. So it was, it's a really interesting example because. It kind of shows you how it's, they pick verses, I wish I had some of them here to show you, <laughs> like verses that would not be out of place, you know, you wouldn't be surprised if you saw them in an actual, you know, death metal song, uh, so it would appeal to death metal fans that way, but since they were actually quotes out of the Bible, uh, that would appeal to the, you know, evangelicals, the, the Christians uh, that were there, that probably hate death, death metal, <laughs> you know, but they like that this band because of this, you know, 
uh, ascription things. I, I thought that was pretty pretty cool. You know, there's the opposite example of that. Uh, Marilyn Manson. If you've ever listened to him, I don't know if he's still popular, but uh, yeah, he was pretty popular when I was coming up. Uh, I remember listening to an interview with him one time, and he said he did that. He uh, got his band together to play on a Christian a Christian uh, radio station, uh, playing death metal songs. But his, <laughs> you know, his was really was just death metal. But he just told them uh, that it was uh, really Christian lyrics. But uh, in his case, it wasn't. But you know, again, since it was death metal, <laughs> you know, nobody could make it out anyway. And so he thought that was funny. <clears throat> anyway, let's move on. Uh, so when you want to use this life illusion of life perspective, there's a few things to keep in mind. Uh, one is to find a song that seems to have a message that isn't obvious. All right, you don't really need to do this. If it's, if it's really clear what the song is about, and there's nothing really hidden there. I mean, why you, you don't need somebody to analyze it. You know, it's <laughs> you know you need to find something again that's got some kind of underlying meaning, or there's something unexpected, or there's something kind of weird going on. Uh, you know, something like that, some kind of unexpected rhetorical message. And there's lots of examples in the book they give you. Uh, the Bruce Springsteen, Born to Run, uh, that Feed Jake song I was talking about. I was uh, really shocked today. I, I went to, uh, you know, I always just thought that was a really sad song about somebody's dog dying, you know, or, you know, thinking about when I die, I want somebody to take care of my dog. And, you know, you, you had that kind of connection to your animals. Uh, that's what I thought the song was about, but actually it was about something qu quite different, and I'll, I'll leave it to you to figure that out if you're curious enough. Maybe you could do your uh, analysis on that, but it's got a very clear, uh, well, it becomes clear. It wasn't clear to those listening to the song, but there's a meaning to that song that I think is missed on most of the people that, that listen to it, and it's pretty uh, cool. Uh, okay, two, describe the intensity and the release patterns, the comic and tragic meanings, and the lyrics. Uh, so again, are these, uh, is it about overcoming the odds? Is there kind of a positive vibe to it? Uh, or is it something sad? You know, I just, I, you know, something I've noticed, a lot of the, you know, I love heavy metal, it's kind of my, my thing. But I noticed a lot of the really big metal bands, you know, like, like if you listen to Black Sabbath, or especially Ozzy Osbourne's later stuff, it might sound, uh, you know, there's almost always like a positive message in there somewhere. You know, when you sit down and listen to the lyrics, which is kind of funny because he's the one that everybody says is, oh, he's you know, he's satanic or he's evil or whatever. When actually he's one of the few that's almost always positive. You know, it's almost always a comic. Might sound a little bit dark musically, but there's usually like a positive, uh, you know, uplifting kind of message in there. And I think that usually is a little bit more uh, popular than the truly dark or sad or you know there's no hope <laughs> kind of kind of songs and some other uh, metal uh, bands but anyway is it comic or tragic uh, and then you can look at the uh, whether it's something about the past experience sort of thinking back looking back reflecting back or is it thinking about the future future possibilities you know that sort of thing uh, and then interpret whether the lyrics and the music are congruent or not and so if it's an upbeat, you know, happy lyrics, is the music also happy and upbeat, or are they doing something weird, you know, mixing those up? Uh, and then finally, what are the potential implications of the message for its audiences? So if somebody, uh, a lot of these songs are written for young people, uh, a lot of it's, uh, what's, what's the target age, like 16-year-olds <laughs> for most of this stuff? Uh, of course, you know, there is music written for kids. But anyway, think about who the music is for. And then think, well, what if they, you know, if that group all listened to this and they bought into this message and, and they believed the argument and they changed their behavior, their beliefs in response to this, what, what would that look like for society? Would this be a positive development or would it be a negative thing? You know, we looked at some of the, a lot of people talk about the negatives. I mean, that's pretty almost kind of easy to do. It's kind of easy. To me, it's kind of like the low-hanging fruit, you know, to find these, you uh, songs for these horrible messages to them and they, oh listen you know uh this <laughs> remember, remember all throughout my childhood there was all these always talk about some song uh that had some kind of a negative message i think it was a it was an ice cube or ice tea something like that there was a song uh, i can't even remember the uh, the name of it but anyway you know maybe not you know it's okay like, if you really want to do something like that fine uh, but i think it's more interesting to find uh, one that has more positive 
take, you know, more positive messages, especially if it's a song that kind of gets vilified wrongly. You know, I love reading these where everybody thinks the song is bad or has a bad message, but then you say, well, actually, let's just sit down and look at the lyrics. <laughs> Voila! <laughs> you were dead wrong. You know, I love that sort of thing. And it's also fun to think about the essay or the songs where the artist had no intention, you know, to have that kind of message, but yet it uh, ended up what, what happened. You know, we mentioned uh, the Rolling Stones, but, you know, you can look at songs by the Beach Boys. Uh, uh, the Cure uh, had one. Uh, they got kind of twisted, you know, and picked up by these other groups, and they were really appalled by that. But, you know, it happens. And uh, there's a band called Insane Clown Posse, uh, another one that uh, <laughs> I don't know what to make of those guys, frankly. But <laughs> uh, kind of, it always kind of shocks people. Uh, when they hear, when they uh, learn more about that band, and they see, well, these guys are like really, there's like a lot of positive, you know, charity giving. You know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, a uh, positive stuff that goes along with it. Kind of contrast with their image. Uh, so anyway, that's the sort of thing I like to, to read more than just the, you know, the the negative stuff. Uh, but anyway, we got two we got two essays in the back of the book. One is about a song. And then, by the way, people always ask, do we just need to do a song? It's fine. Uh, you could do a music video. That way you can talk about the visuals as well and combine it with some of these other perspectives. Uh, or you could talk about a, an album. You know, I get a lot of people that want to talk about a whole album. Uh, or, like in this example, is about a, uh, multiple albums, like a whole band's career. I think they look at three or four albums by this band Creed. You know, any of that would be fine. You know, it just uh, <clears throat> depends on what you want to do, basically. Now, if it's uh, an album where the songs have no relationship to each other, like a Greatest Hits album or something, I don't know if that would work very well. Uh, but if they're kind of tied together, you know, that might that might work. Okay. So, anyway, read those two S or one. You don't have to do both. Just pick one. Uh, and then ask, answer this question. Does the author's arguments ring true? Why or why not? Okay, we'll end it there. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you're excited about this music perspective. I know it's, it's a good one. <laughs> anyway, I hope you had some fun with it. Um, and please, if you have any questions or comments, you know, please share those. I'd love to read them, and I will see you next time.